start right now. And we begin tonight with a water main break on the city's west side. Residents living in the area of North Sabinas and Woodlawn say they have been without water for hours. We have reached out to SAWS to see if they're aware of the issue, but have not yet heard back. It to other news, he's used to saving lives during high risk situations. But yesterday, a Cibolo police sergeant found himself in a high risk situation. He and his four sons lost their home to a fire on the far north side. From the front, you can't see much damage, but in the back, you can see where the home is clearly unlivable, gutted all the way through. The night team's Jaffney Gray with the sergeant's quick actions to save his family's life. I've spent the better part of 20 years looking bad things in the eye, serving my community with all my heart. It hits close to home. Around 11.30 a.m. Sunday, life changed for Cibolo Police Sergeant Christopher Soto and his four sons. Their home here on Oracle Drive gutted by a fire, making it a total loss. Obviously, the fire started right here. I was in my bedroom, and I heard a, a, a loud bang, uh, and then what, what's, what sounded like crackling, like crackling wood. As Chris sat at the foot of the bed, you see there yesterday morning putting his shoes on. He had no idea that he would ever be placed in this tragic situation to where now he could see the blue sky through the damage done to his bedroom ceiling. Being a law enforcement family, Soto says he and his sons jumped into action. Just screamed at the top of my lungs, pretty much fire, uh, get out. My first thought was that a burglar, like a burglar was breaking in or something like that. And then all I see was this big flame coming through the window. They all managed to get out safely with only the clothes on their backs. I say seven, ten minutes in this whole thing. Everything we've ever owned, everything we ever touched, everything we ever worked for, blood, sweat, and tears was gone. There's no doubt about it. We will, we will bounce back. Since the fire, the family has received an outpour of support from the community, everything from financial support and food donations. Soto says they plan to take things a day at a time. My home lives in Caleb and Micah and Elijah and little Jalen. At the end of the day, all those things can be replaced. Jaffany Gray, KSAT 12 News. The Sotos are staying with family and friends until they figure out what's next. The cause of the fire is currently unknown. Turning to the latest COVID-19 numbers in Bear County, city and county officials announcing 46 new cases and no new deaths. In addition, 184 patients are currently in the hospital locally with 78 in, the, in intensive care and 48, 40 that is, on ventilators. Contact tracing thrust back into the spotlight after President Donald Trump tested positive for COVID-19. The challenge of tracking down everyone he came into close contact with is one health department's nationwide is one that health departments nationwide are facing in case after case, including Metro Health here in San Antonio. The night team's Tiffany Huertas with the experience or lack of the two San Antonians had after they tested positive. Since COVID, I now it's hard for me to breathe. I have like the side effects of like me, like my losing my taste buds still like randomly. I get headaches randomly. 26 year old Tiffany Jew says she got tested at a local clinic in June. The doctor all over the phone said that someone was supposed to be contacting me from the city and I got no call. Jew did her own contact tracing, calling people she was in close contact with, plus stores and restaurants she went to. Metro Health says if a case was backlogged or not submitted on time, they may have not been able to reach them or did not have the correct information. It says contact tracers typically call three times on three different days and times. Justin Vine was hospitalized on June 30th, where he tested positive for COVID-19. I went to the hospital and they pretty much uh, had me on oxygen right away. Vine has recovered and was recently released from the hospital. He says Metro Health never called him or his wife. So we never got any call from the government or from anybody. Dr. Anita Kurian with Metro Health says while the main issue is people not answering the phone or returning calls, there is another roadblock. Even if they pick up the phone and talk to us, uh, sometimes they refuse to give us the list of contacts. The state took over contact tracing in San Antonio last month. Metro Health employees who were helping with contact tracing have returned to their original jobs. The city says the calls from the state will come from different numbers 
members. If you don't answer, they will leave detailed information to call back. Metro Health says it's important to answer the phone to provide a complete investigation. If you don't answer, they may miss people and could put others at risk. Tiffany Huertas, KSAT 12 News. It is a news bar owners in Comal County have been waiting to hear. The county is opting to reopen. This comes one day after Governor Greg Abbott issued an order allowing bars to open at 50% capacity in regions with low COVID-19 hospitalizations. County judges must approve the decision to reopen bars, which Comal County Judge Sherman Kraus did. In a news release, Kraus says many businesses in our community have been struggling because of the pandemic, but we have an opportunity to reopen in a way that keeps customers and employees safe, end quote. As for Bear County Judge Nelson Wolf, he says the county will not opt in for now. Is South Texas in dire need of blood donations still, which is why several drives have been set up for this week. Tomorrow, the South Texas Blood and Tissue Center will be accepting donations at a drive through event in the 11,000 block of Alamo Ranch Parkway. Donors at this drive will receive a free movie ticket. There will be two other opportunities this week as well. One at NISD's Paul Taylor Fieldhouse on Wednesday and Thursday from 1 till 2 p.m. On Thursday, only at the Stone Oak Holiday Inn. That one is from 11 until 4. Of course, you're going to need to register first. We have a link to help right now on KSAT.com. Bear County Sheriff's deputies say it's too early to tell whether an 18 wheeler truck driver knew he'd hit and killed a man before driving off this afternoon. The incident happened off North Abbott Road near St. Hedwick in East Bear County around 2:30. When deputies arrived, they found the 58 year old victim who were told was a nearby resident dead at the scene. Deputies tell us it appears the driver who was delivering gravel in the area may have been backing up when he killed the man. The incident is still under investigation. It was set up to help with mental health calls. In its first week of operations, Bear County's new mental health program, which finds dispatchers on the front line of identifying mental health calls, saw a total of seven calls. That's according to the county. The program is called Specialized Multidisciplinary Alternate Response Team, or SMART. Sarah Hogan, the Division Director for Southwest Texas Crisis Collaborative from STRAC, says of those calls, two of them were dispatched directly from a 911 call. Five were calls dispatched to a patrol deputy that identified the call to be mental health related. Some subjects of those calls were transported to a behavioral health facility for treatment. The others were resolved at the scene. Leveling the playing field, providing quality parks in both wealthy neighborhoods and low income neighborhoods is crucial for cities aiming to provide equal access for all. The 19th Patty Santos takes a look at the importance of providing safe parks to everyone as part of our Voices of a Nation series exploring race, equity and multiculturalism. I've noticed that Northside Parks have everything, everything, and we are striving to get the same thing that the Northside has. Like paved trails, nice clean restrooms, updated playgrounds, and dog parks. It's taken 10 years and millions of dollars, but members with the St. Timothy Cops Metro Core Team, a community organization, have turned a one-strug haven blight into a community space. It was a, a place where hookers also hanged around and, and their jobs were here giving business. Benavides Park went from this to this. Just because we live here in the west side does not mean that we can't have the best. There's a very, very, very low income. The park is in the 78207 zip code, one of the poorest in the city and next to several housing projects. The Trust for Public Land says the question isn't just how much green space do poor communities have access to, but how does it compare to those in higher income neighborhoods? Having a patch of grass is probably better than having no grass anywhere. Um, but we now know that it's possible to create better high quality parks for people where they're in those existing spaces. Parks are more than a space for exercise. They can help reduce crime and improve public health. They can be places for outdoor learning and education. They can be great places for just um, bringing people together to talk about what's happening in their space. Equitable park access, that is a priority for our department 
and for the city of San Antonio. Here's a glance at how many parks there are in each district. District 1 has the most with 50. District 9 has the fewest with 11. There's more than 260 green spaces in the city, but not all are created equal. The city says taxpayers have the say over what their parks look like. Our park system is for everybody, not just a single demographic or single population in San Antonio. And because it's for everybody, we need to make sure that we're listening to everybody in those investments to help shape the vision for what we want to see. Our children are entitled to the same thing, whether they're poor or rich, right? The children need it. Patty Santos, KSAT 12 News. The 2017 bond included about 50 park projects. The next bond is coming up in 2022. To make sure your voice is heard in the next bond project, the city encourages people to get involved. You can attend community meetings, fill out city surveys, or talk to your city council person to tell them what you want to see in your community park. Another reminder, polls open for early voting tomorrow morning. Beginning at 8, they close each day this week at 6 p.m. In weeks to come, they'll be open later. But yes, you can vote at any polling location within the county. That includes the new mega voting centers at the AT&T Center and the Alzevar Shrine Auditorium. For a list of polling locations, where they're open, as well as how to prepare, you can head to the politics section of KSAT.com. Election day, by the way, is Tuesday, November 3rd. Believe it or not, we actually had a weak cold front move through earlier today. So we have the north wind and much drier air in place. Dew point of 49. Air temperature, though, at 76. This kind of cold front doesn't really change how it feels outside. For the rest of the night, we'll gradually fall through the 60s and start the day tomorrow at 58 degrees. That's in San Antonio. It's going to be a little bit warmer south of town. Also, you may have noticed a bit of dust out there today. We're going to talk about what caused that, our dry weather pattern, and a real deal cold front that's on the way for later this week. All that coming up, Steve. Thank you, Adam. Still ahead on the night, be with more than 215,000 American lives lost. The coronavirus pandemic at the forefront of the presidential campaigns. Coming up, how both the president and his rival Joe Biden are changing their strategies. Plus, the high stakes Supreme Court confirmation hearing for Judge Amy Coney Barrett is now underway. A recap of day one coming up after the break. A bitter political battle on Capitol Hill as confirmation hearings begin for President Trump's nominee to the U.S. Supreme Court. ABC's Faith Abube is in Washington with a recap of day one. While protesters clashed outside, inside the U.S. Capitol, Judge Amy Coney Barrett sat quietly as Republicans and Democrats also clashed over her nomination to the U.S. Supreme Court. My Democratic colleagues will say this has never been done and they're right in this regard. Nobody's, I think, has ever been confirmed in an election year past July. This isn't Donald Trump's country. It is yours. This shouldn't be Donald Trump's judge. It should be yours. Senate Democrats quickly turning the confirmation hearing into a fight to save the Affordable Care Act. Stripping health care from millions of Americans during a pandemic, that's really what is at stake. They're scared, Judge Barrett. They're scared that your confirmation would rip from them the very health care protections. If Barrett is confirmed, she would tilt the ideological balance of the court to a conservative majority. One of her first cases could affect millions who stand to lose coverage if the Affordable Care Act on the court's docket a week after the November election is struck down. By replacing Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg with someone who will undo her legacy, President Trump is attempting to roll back Americans' rights for decades to come. Republicans firing back. Our Democratic colleagues want you to guarantee a result in a case as a quid pro quo for your confirmation. It's outrageous. The nominee herself finally weighing in during her opening remarks. A judge must apply the law as it is written, not as she wishes it were. And today's five-hour hearing wrapped up with no questions for Judge Barrett. Senators will start grilling her tomorrow. Faith Abube, ABC News, Washington.
All right, 76 degrees out there, but it, it was kind of like mm -hmm. gritty, cloudy, yeah. Uh -huh. gritty. Yeah, it was a weird afternoon. It was. So we actually had, technically had a cold front move in. It okay. shifted our wind out of the north and it did drop the humidity. So by definition, a cold front, but it didn't have a big impact on temperatures. This one won't. What it did have a big impact on was the haze in our sky and the particulates in the air. Let's go to our time lapse and I'll tell you about this. So at noon, just fine. Your typical blue sky out there, but watch a few hours later. Once that wind shifts northerly behind that weak front, boom. You can see it right there. That dust blew in from the plain states, from Kansas, Oklahoma, even North Texas. Their drier land kicked up that dust and sent it here to South Texas. And so that's why we had that extra dust in the air today. Still evident out there tonight as well, but likely to dissipate into tomorrow. So we started the day at 73, well above average. Then we topped out at 93 this afternoon. That's 10 degrees above average, but shy of the record, 99. Whereas yesterday, was a record high temperature of 97. So back to that little weak cold front, that cool front. Right now it's south of San Antonio, starting to stall out. So Carrizo Springs still muggy at 63, for the dew point that is. Then you get up to Uvalde, a dew point of 47. In the hill country, dew points in the 30s. Meanwhile, Corpus Christi still on the muggy side of that boundary at 72. And this is going to play a big role in overnight lows. The dew point doesn't just tell us if it's comfortable or uncomfortable outside, but also is a good indicator of how much the temperature can fall off at night. So right now we're in the 70s for most of us. Fredericksburg 64, still 83 Catula in Del Rio, but 76 San Antonio and Pleasanton at 77. Tomorrow morning, basically along and north of Highway 90, we're talking upper 50s, hill country, low to mid 50s. But where we have the extra humidity in the air, the temperature doesn't drop as efficiently at night. So Laredo, Corpus Christi, low 70s and 60s for a good portion of the KSAT 12 viewing area south of San Antonio, including Pleasanton and Catula. By tomorrow afternoon, we all even out upper 90 or upper 80s, right near 90 degrees from 90 in Carrizo Springs to 87 in New Braunfels and 92 in Laredo. All right, you ready for this? We're going to feel similar warmth the next several days all the way through Thursday, but then boom, look at that. Look what happens to our high temperatures. We go from 90 on Thursday down into the 70s for Friday and Saturday. So that's what I consider more of a real deal cold front that's moving into town and you'll really feel the effects of it. So let's talk about the overall weather pattern that's going to be doing this quite across Texas right now. We had some record breaking heat this weekend. Temperatures are moderating a little bit right now, but we'll do more so later in the week. A little ripple in the upper level flow is off to the north of us. That's going to be important because we'll have a bigger dip in the upper level flow, pull some of this cooler air southward. So right now in Canada, temperatures are in the 30s and even some 40s. So not frigid air. No, it's still October, but that cooler air mass is going to be diving southward later this week. The core of it will be around the Great Lakes through Thursday, still warm here, but then we get clipped by that cooler air mass and it's going to bring us a return to some fall like conditions. So let's talk about this tomorrow morning, 58 by the afternoon, 88, mostly sunny, a light northeasterly breeze, still some dust in the air, especially the first part of the day. Humid on Wednesday at 92 Thursday before the front arrives. I still think we'll make it to 90 degrees and then boom, temperatures plummet. It's going to be fall like or as some people would say, Pumpkin spice weather. Yeah. I hate saying it, but it's it's the <laughs> truth. It's how people know it nowadays. Yeah. And our low point will be Saturday morning at 48. Look at that. I'll have my cup ready. Thank yeah. you so much, Adam. Facts are facts. Mm -hmm. All right. You feel for Dak Prescott because he got hurt, yeah. but also because the timing wasn't great for his future. Because remember, he and his team only agreed to a one-year franchise tag with the Dallas Cowboys, and his season is now over. Will this affect his long-term involvement with the Dallas Cowboys organization? We'll put it to the Joneses. And the Texas Longhorns game against the Baylor Bears is very much in jeopardy now. Coming up. Pro football coverage. Powered by Davis Law Firm. Dak Prescott is home from the hospital released today less than 24 hours after having what the team is calling successful surgery to repair a compound fracture and dislocation of his right ankle. The horrific and season-ending injury took place in the third quarter. The Cowboys 37-34 victory over the Giants and Dak decided to scramble was brought down hard by safety Logan Ryan. He knew immediately he was in serious condition. So did you at home. Amid the tears after he was loaded on the cart, 
King, his teammates paying their respects as some of them, including Ezekiel Elliott, even visited his quarterback in the hospital. The normal recovery time for an injury like this is four to six months. So what is his future with the Cowboys? Remember, he and his team could not come to agreement on a long-term contract this offseason, selling for the franchise tag for just one year. Cowboys Vice President Stephen Jones has asked if this injury could impact the team's long-term plans at quarterback. Absolutely not. Absolutely not. He's our future. Anyone can overcome anything and be back. This is something that uh, you know our doctors feel good that they'll, uh, they'll overcome and come back better than ever. And according to Clarence Hill, the Fort Worth Star Telegram, the Cowboys will be signing former SMU and Longhorns quarterback Garrett Gilbert as some insurance. After picking up their first win of the season in the 30 to 14 victory against Jacksonville, now the Texans turn their attention on trying to pick up their first road win against the Titans in Tennessee. That game is still on for now after the league had to postpone the Titans game this week against the Bills until tomorrow after as many as 25 players and staff members have tested positive for COVID-19 since September 24. So how difficult is it to prepare to play against a team that struggles so much with the coronavirus? The league is going to try to stay on top of it to make sure that uh, they have had negative tests for consecutive days before they put them on the field. And so uh, we have to rely on on that. Uh, I think that there may be some apprehension by some guys, but I think for the most part, the guys will, will go play and uh, and feel decent about playing. All right, kickoff against the Titans in Tennessee on Sunday. It's set for noon. The Texas Longhorns' next game against the Baylor Bears set for a week from this Saturday is now in jeopardy. That's after Baylor athletic director reports another major outbreak of the coronavirus. Mark Rhodes, I should say Mac Rhodes, is reporting that 28 football players and 14 football staff members have active COVID-19 cases. Rhodes added 17 players are in quarantine with close contact. That's another adjustment this Texas team may have to make after losing their Red River rivalry to Oklahoma in a four-overtime shootout in the Cotton Bowl Saturday, 55-43. to But UT head coach Tom Herman says... He's not even thinking about Baylor after the Longhorns have now dropped to one and two in the Big 12 and has Herman's hot seat getting a lot hotter. Our focus, rightfully so, has to be about us. We've got so many things that we need to clean up, so many things that, again, without a spring practice, without a normal training camp and trying to install new systems on both sides of the ball, we just we need the practice. And we need to work. And, you know, we're, our plan, we're not even going to introduce Baylor until Friday. If they play the game on October the 24th against Baylor, the kickoff has been set at 2.30. The big game and our big game coverage is Friday night next. Here we go. The big game and our big game coverage is Friday night as a showdown district 27-6A, one of the most difficult in all of the state when the Wagner Thunderbirds put their number one ranking in 12's top 12 on the line against the Steel Knights. Due to the COVID-19 pandemic, the Thunderbirds did not kick off their season until last Friday night in their return to 6A football when they were going to be the previously six-ranked and undefeated Smithson Valley Rangers in overtime, 27-24. Now they face Steele in Linhoff Stadium. The Knights already have three games under their belt, including the season opener with a team from Virginia. Remember that, Life Christian? They lost that game 26-14, also lost to Reagan 23-20, before opening district play with a 24-6 victory at East Central last Friday. We're very motivated, starting one and two. We need to finish uh, district games, and uh, we know they're a great opponent, so... And we're a good team. We just need to prepare. They're tough and physical. Uh, they made it pretty far last year in the playoffs. Uh, we're really going to have to bring our game, you know, to step up, everybody be physical. And I think it's a great opponent, you know, going here on the season. They have good offense and good defense. Uh, watch film on them. Look pretty physical, pretty fast. We have our hands full. It's going to be a fight. It's not going to be as easy as it was back then. But we still have a chance in that, you know, people better not sleep on us because we will come. All right, kickoff Friday night. Lenhoff is set for 7.30 in case that 12 sports will be there. Game two of the ALCS. Astros looking to even up their series against the Rays. Bottom of the first, two on. Manuel Margot drills a shot deep to center field. That's gone. A three-run home run opens the score. The Rays go on to win it 4-2. to two. They now lead the best of seven series. Two games to none. The Astros need to get a win here pretty quick. Keep them being swept. Mm -hmm. That's right. Thank you, Greg. You got it. Still to come, as the COVID-19 death toll rises in the U.S., a new study finds the virus can survive on some surfaces longer than previously thought. But plus, we're discussing the state of COVID-19 in Bear County with a local epidemiologist. During our KSAT Q&A, it's up next.
Separating fact from fiction, it's what we do during KSAT Q&A, or attempt to do anyway. And we are joined tonight by Sharice Roar Allegrini, who's an epidemiologist. She is the CEO of the San Antonio AIDS Foundation, and we are leaning on her heavily for her disease detective skills. And so I want to thank you for joining us, Sharice. And, and first off, what, what are you seeing in the trends in Bear County uh, and, and are there anything, is there anything that's alarming to you? Sure, it's actually pretty concerning. Um, fortunately, we saw a downturn on the last four or five weeks or so, and we were really hopeful about that. But if we look at the infection rate over the last few months, we're starting to see a pretty substantial increase um, from the last two weeks. So it had leveled off a little bit and now it's increasing quite a lot, which is really concerning. Um, I think, you know, we were on the right track, but we um, are not dropping down fast enough. And it's gonna be really important that we stick with some pretty strict control measures. I want to ask you a little bit about the upcoming holidays. Obviously, we've talked a lot about Halloween in the past few weeks. Mm -hmm. Right after Halloween, we have two big ones where families tend to get together, Thanksgiving and Christmas. What mm -hmm. advice and recommendations do you have for folks who are considering travel or considering those family get-togethers? It's, it's so hard because we want to be with our families, and I think we need to be with our families. This has been such a difficult year. The important thing is going to be to maintain all of your control measures that you, you do now. So if you can avoid traveling long distances, do, just because it's better if you stay in one place and you're not gonna be exposed to a lot of people. If you're gonna gather with your family, try to keep that gathering small. And I know how hard that is. I have an enormous family, so I get it. But try to keep limit the number of people that come over. And one wonderful thing about Texas is you can pretty much do it outside. For Thanksgiving and Christmas. So think about how you can have a gathering outside so that you can keep the distance and keep things safer and really just limit who, who comes over um, and wear masks as much as you can. I know you can't do that when you're eating, but that's why, you know, being outside is better than inside. So it's really following all the control measures that we already follow um, and just being extra cautious. We usually see a spike of flu right after the holidays, and that's because of travel and close contact. So we want to try to limit that as much as possible. Never it, thought about having it outside. That's that'd be, a good it's a, piece. It's yeah. a great idea. Just wear a really <laughs> loose jacket to, you know, <laughs> all the food. All right, so, but, so my, my next question, when you say control measures, I just want to make sure that's the mask, that's the hand washing, that's the six feet social distancing, all of that. So when you say control measures, that's what you're talking right. about. And, and outside, if you can. That just makes it better. <laughs> it, how would you, it, there's there's a lot of people, and, and we've seen it, I've seen it with some of my friends who get COVID-19 and they're ashamed to tell people. They're ashamed to let somebody know. I mean, it, it seems like it's a blame shame game going on. Are you seeing right. some of that too? I, absolutely. Um, I just had a conversation earlier about HIV and how similar the response is with COVID. Um, we, uh, we are a blame and shame culture, and unfortunately, that's become very significant during COVID. And that hinders our ability to stop the spread because people are afraid to tell you that they have COVID because you're going to blame them or make them feel bad. And so if they don't tell you, then you don't know that you need to protect yourself extra, you need to get tested, et cetera. So we really need to reframe this so that there shouldn't be stigma attached. You're not a bad person if you get COVID. You didn't do something wrong you shouldn't be blamed in any way it happens and we have to do the most that we can to prevent spreading it to other people I want to talk to you a little bit about contact tracing earlier in the show we did a story about some of the problems that we were seeing here locally with contact tracing you recently wrote an article for medium.com that talked about the two parts of disease investigation can you tell us a little bit about that article Sure. So there's prospective contact tracing. That's when you get called because you've been a contact to a, a confirmed case or a probable case. And we tell you that you've been exposed and you need to get tested. That's when we're trying to put out the fire. We try to keep it from spreading into a new group of people. Uh, retrospective contact tracing is what we do as epidemiologists to find out where that fire started. Um, we're not always able to identify a precise location, but we look for patterns. 
say we have five cases and they all say that in the last 14 days they went to this location or they were at a party together or there's some connection then we can find out okay there's an event that happened or there was a location where they all visited at the same time it's not definitive proof that that location or that event was the source but it does give us an idea and it helps because if we know a location for example we can go to that location and say okay what's happening here that needs to change not just shut down but is it that the tables aren't far enough apart or there's not good ventilation or people aren't wearing masks like they're supposed to and we can address that specific to that location more often in the last six months what we've seen is that when we trace it back we find it families family gatherings that are problematic and so that informs us because we can change our messaging to really talk about those family gatherings like i just described do things like stay outside keep the group small recognize that um, your family you're close to but they're not necessarily safe from COVID, so you have to still take all those precautions but being able to go both forward to prevent the spread backward to try to find out where it started so that maybe we can identify new hot spots too that we we can catch those before they start to spread into a bigger population that's really important in contact tracing what's the latest cutting edge thinking when you're th when we think about COVID-19 I mean I know that it's a novel coronavirus so we don't know everything about it we continue to learn things about it is aerosolization the latest uh thing that you that people are learning about this that's gotten a lot of attention, and that's because we used to think it wasn't aerosolized at all. And, and a lot of viruses will get aerosolized when you're in a healthcare situation. So because you have a patient in the hospital, they're likely to have a very high viral load, and you do a procedure that um, is going to bring up the aerosol. So that's always been a risk. What's new with COVID is that it appears that the virus lives in the air for longer than we thought. We used to say it was just droplet transmitted, and that's why that six foot distance was so important. But there are some studies now that show that it can linger in the air for longer periods of time. Now, it's not like measles where it's all around you and it lives for hours, but it does hang out around for a while. And so when you've got a lot of people in an enclosed space for a long period of time, the virus um, is more likely to be transmitted in that environment, even if you're more than six feet apart. Very yeah, like hairspray, like aerosol. That's where aerosolization comes from. It Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I, I bring up hairspray because, you know, <laughs> I use a lot right. of it. I mean, you know, just take my Aquanet, for example. Yes. Dr. Right. Cherise Roar Ali Greeny, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate it. Thank you so much for inviting me. Take thank care. you. We'll be right back. Never miss a story. Watch live or when you want. San Antonio's latest news and weather. Streaming free on KSAT TV. The COVID-19 death toll in the United States now at more than 214,000. As a new study finds the virus can survive on some surfaces longer than once thought. And tonight, President Trump given the all clear from his doctor holding a campaign event in a critical battleground state. ABC's Marcy Gonzalez reports. President Trump back on the campaign trail for the first time since being diagnosed with COVID-19, holding a rally in the key state of Florida before a packed, mostly maskless crowd. Just one week after the president was released from the hospital, his doctor says he's tested negative on consecutive days, concluding he is not infectious to others. The president going even further. I went through it. Now they say I'm immune. I can feel I feel so powerful. I'll walk into that audience. I'll walk in there. I'll kiss everyone in that audience. I'll kiss the guys and the beautiful women and them. Every mile just. But medical experts say immunity is not well understood and it's unclear how long it lasts. A 25 year old man in Nevada who tested positive for COVID-19 was reinfected just 48 days after being diagnosed with a different strain of the coronavirus. Joe Biden campaigning in Ohio, calling the president's behavior irresponsible. His reckless personal conduct since his diagnosis 
has been unconscionable. In more than half the country, the number of COVID cases on the rise. 14 states hitting a record number of hospitalizations this week. When you look at what's going on in the United States, it's really very troublesome. All this as a new study suggests that COVID may be able to survive on surfaces for up to 28 days. The virus able to stay on non-porous surfaces like glass, stainless steel, vinyl and paper. But the actual amount of virus found was quite small and it would be unlikely to cause infection. Marcy Gonzalez, ABC News, Los Angeles. Across the pond, a resurgence of coronavirus infections across Europe. Over the weekend, a record 100,000 new daily cases were reported for the first time. Spain declaring a state of emergency for its capital, Madrid. Italy making masks mandatory even outdoors. And Britain braced for a new COVID-19 alert system, which will put the north of England, which is in the midst of an outbreak, under a strict lockdown. Scientists say rates of new infections, while much higher than the first wave in spring, cannot be compared because testing has increased. But hospitals are filling up with COVID-19 patients across the continent. A California state and county election officials investigating following the appearance of unofficial ballot drop boxes. California Secretary of State's office says it's looking into the unauthorized boxes which have popped up in a few counties. The first of which spotted by a pastor who says one popped up in front of his church. The L.A. County Registrar's Office, which supervises the election, said in a statement, quote, the drop box at Canyon Country Church does not comply with regulations for official ballot drop boxes. We are working with council to issue a cease and desist letter and have reported this to the Secretary of State's office, end quote. The word official connotes some kind of government approval or activity, and that might raise some issues with the appropriate election authorities. Now, under California state law, anyone is allowed to collect ballots from voters and deliver them to county election offices. So while the drop boxes may technically be legal, signage misrepresenting the drop box as official is against the law. Microsoft has stopped a massive hacking operation, one it says could have impacted the presidential election. The company announced today it took down the servers behind TrickBot. That's an enormous malware network criminals were using to launch other cyber attacks, including a strain of highly potent ransomware. Microsoft said it obtained a federal court order to disable the IP addresses associated with TrickBot servers and work with telecom providers around the world to stamp out the network. But Microsoft warns it could happen again. Happening around Texas, a black man is suing the Galveston Police Department for $1 million. You might remember the video from August of last year showing Donald Neely being led through town tied to two officers on horseback while handcuffed after he was arrested for criminal trespassing. This is what happened. Neely is now accusing officers of extreme and outrageous conduct and that he, quote, felt as though he was put on display as slaves once were, end quote. The trespassing case was ultimately dismissed. The department apologized to Neely, but no word on the city's or the department's response to Neely's new lawsuit. Take one last look outside with live cam this evening. 76 degrees, as Adam mentioned, that front came in earlier and mm -hmm. certainly can feel it outside. Yeah, it dried us out a bit. It really dropped the dew points and the humidity, especially locally and along and north of Highway 90. I do want to point out that we, of course, could use a little more rainfall. The aquifer is down half a foot again today. We're at <laughs> 660. Point three, still about three feet below the October average. Mold, ragweed, and pigweed all on the low end. And I want to show you a picture from earlier today. This is the view up in Bandera. And looking off basically over that small valley into the horizon there, you see the dust from the cold front that moved in earlier today. It brought some Texas and Oklahoma and Kansas dust along with it. And that's why you had that haze out there today. Now, another thing. I want to point out here, I don't necessarily like pointing it out, but this view here, Bandera, in oh what, two and a half months? Poof, we'll see the plumes of mountain cedar coming off the trees. I'm sorry, it's just a fact. And there's a nice look at the uh, hazy sunset from the dust, the dusty sunset in Terrell Heights. All right.
Outside right now, we're at 76 degrees, dew point of 49. That north wind, like I said, it kicked in the dust, but also dropped the dew point. So drier air in place right now. So it's comfortable with the lack of humidity. But that also means the temperature can cool off pretty efficiently. So we're thinking upper 50s tonight in and around San Antonio, Highway 90 and, port, and points northward. Not much of a breeze, but it's still there. Six miles per hour here in town. Hondo at eight miles per hour out of the northeast. But the cold front has yet to really move to the Gulf coastline. So Victoria, Beeville, Corpus Christi, Laredo, still in some mugginess. You see our dew points took a big hit today because of that front. Compared to this time yesterday, dew points are 15 to 22 degrees lower around San Antonio, but that front has stalled right along the coastal plain. So still muggy Victoria, Corpus Christi, and Houston. Temperatures right now? Well, 70s for the most part, still some locations in the lower 80s, and then you get down into the 60s and 50s farther north in Texas. Dallas 66, 64 in Lubbock and Abilene right now at 59. Tomorrow we'll start the day at 58 degrees by the noon hour up to 80 and then 88 the high temperature. A lot of sunshine, a northeasterly breeze at about three to eight miles per hour. Wednesday, the humidity's back. Lower 90s, muggy and sunny. Not the record breaking weather that we had yesterday, but still on the warm side for this time of year. Then we get into Thursday. I think we'll make it to 90 right before that cold front hits. And then the cold front hits and drops us down into the 70s for afternoon highs by Friday and Saturday with morning. Look at that morning on Saturday. Upper 40s at sunrise. Can't wait. Thank you so much, Adam. All right. It may be kind of a personal question, but does your washing machine smell? If it does, there are multiple reasons why that could be. We're going to run through a few of them next. Funky smelling washing machines. If you have a front loader, it could be mold or mildew. The problem's been around for years. 12 in your side's Marilyn Moritz explains why and what you can do about it. I just completed a load of laundry and I wanted to show you the gray mildewy gook. Deirdre Mile says her front loading washing machine stinks. It smells like a damp basement. The problem isn't new. Smelly washers with mold have been a problem for about 20 years. Despite design changes over the years, the issue has persisted. GE recently came out with a front loader designed to eliminate excess moisture. Consumer Reports found it did reduce humidity in the drum, but says it's no guarantee that mold won't grow. Mold spores can be found anywhere you wear your clothes. So you actually toss them into the washer where there might be residual detergent leftover lint, hair, and any other organic material. Add to that lingering moisture in the machine and mold can flourish. To combat the odor, make sure you're not using too much detergent and that it's HE. Run your cleaning cycle regularly, and if you don't have one, run an empty load on hot with a cup of bleach. And after the last load, dry the inside of the door and the rubber gasket. And if you don't have kids, leave the door open. As for Deirdre, she's frustrated and buying a new top loader. Consumer Reports recommends this LG for about $650. It's water and energy efficient. And if you're shopping for a dryer too, the matching electric LG dryer got excellent ratings. It will cost about $1,300 for the set. Marilyn Moritz, KSAT 12 News. Well, traveling to and from Houston and Chicago just got a little easier. Southwest Airlines announced today it's expanding operations to include Houston's Bush Intercontinental Airport and Chicago's O'Hare Airport. The company already serves another airport in each city, so this just gives customers more access. Service is expected to take off early next year. A carnival canceling all the remaining cruises from its Florida ports for the month of November. In a statement today, the cruise line says its six ships in Port Canaveral at the Port of Miami will not set sail next month. The CDC extended its no sail order for cruise operations until October 31st due to the pandemic. The cruise line said that made making any plans for a November restart impossible. Two other cruise lines also based in Miami, Norwegian and Royal Caribbean have dropped their November excursion plans as well. Wonder Woman is taking on the role of yet another powerful female figure. Details on the new project, still ahead.
All right, check these out. These are slices of pink glow pineapples. Mm, They're not so yellow good. pineapple dyed pink. They actually grow like this. The Del Monte Fresh Produce exclusive just came out today. Del Monte started developing it back in 2005. Then it got FDA approval for human consumption in 2016. Apparently, they take about two years to grow. Then they're handpicked in what they call ultra limited harvests on a select farm in Costa Rica. And that means they're not cheap. They cost $49 each. Del Monte says these pineapples are supposed to be juicier and sweeter. They better be for yeah, 49, 49 bucks. bucks. Yeah, a big screen superhero has set her eye on a historical power player. Wonder Woman star Gal Gadot is set to star in a new film about the life of Egyptian queen Cleopatra. The Israeli will reunite with Wonder Woman director Patty Jenkins for the project. Godot says the new version of Cleopatra is the first to tell the story of the Queen of Egypt through a woman's eyes. However, the production is not without controversy. Some critics complain an Israeli should not play an Egyptian queen. And some historians were quick to point out that the real Cleopatra was Macedonian Greek. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. So tomorrow morning, south of Highway 90 and south of I-10 will be in the 60s. But locally and north of that boundary, well, we're going to be in the 50s. So a little difference out there because of some humidity that's still in the air, especially south of San Antonio. Then by the afternoon, we all warm up. Upper 80s right near 90 degrees. Crank up the heat a little bit more as we get into to Wednesday. Then Thursday still near 90. The cold front hits Thursday afternoon. So the transition is happening Thursday night. So by Friday and into the weekend, you'll notice a big change. Cooler, more fall like air in place. Thank you, Adam. That does it for the night. Don't forget, good morning, San Antonio starts at 430. Good night.